Yeah. All right, good. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Thanks. All right. So, uh, well, I've just so said, um, your sorry knee surgeon, sorry orthopedic clinic. Why don't you say hello, give yourself a quick introduction, and let's talk about causes of knee injuries then, please. Okay, so my name's Paul Tricker. I'm a knee specialist. I only do knee surgery. I work NHS <coughs> at Ashford and St. Peter's, privately at Surrey Orthopaedic Clinic with um, a number of colleagues. I also work at the Sharon Clinic in London. <coughs> um, yeah, I do full practice from children to adults. Okay, yeah. From repair to replacements, yeah. And you're basically a dedicated knee specialist. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Well, let's talk about causes of knee injuries then. One, you okay. take through um, a brief overview, please. Okay. So what I'm trying to talk about is what, what causes, what are the main causes of a knee injury? Um, so if we go back to if there's an acute swelling, that's yep. normally blood in the knee. So what causes uh, hemarthrosis or uh, and a knee full of blood and they're the things we need to exclude um, so fracture number one mm -hmm. uh, number two is a uh, extensor mechanism disruption so by that I mean a patella tendon rupture a quads tendon rupture yeah or a patella fracture okay uh, number three uh, a major ligament yeah and in fact if you have a child who has a blood a knee full of blood 65% chance to have torn the crucial ligament, which is a okay. very high okay. number. Uh, number four okay. is meniscus, uh, a big meniscal tear. We know peripheral meniscal tears of a blood supply. Right. And number five is the red herrings, people who are on blood thinners, uh, warfarin or injections because they've had TIAs or they need it for funny heart rhythms. They can get an um, increased risk of bleeding. Okay, so like you said, you know, people with an ACL injury, we know they get hemarthrosis, but even a red on red peripheral municipal tear will yeah. give you that hemarthrosis. Yeah, maybe not as a, an acute swelling of blood like an ACL yeah. or a PCL, mm -hmm. but a, 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 a knee full of blood nonetheless. Okay, so since, since we're talking about injuries at the moment, could you sort of give us an overview of what it's like out there in AE at the moment, please? Yes, yeah, so. Our unit, we're looking after all the uh, the walking wounded. Yeah. Um, so almost like a clean A and E, leaving A and E to look after the, uh, the the COVID patients. So it's a physically separate entity. Yeah. So okay. we have a we have a clean A and E, a clean X ray, clean as can be. Obviously, you can have coronavirus or COVID without without symptoms. Yeah. Uh, but we see asymptomatic people um, without temperature, and so it's quite. A, as safe as can be environment to come in. Yeah. And we've seen a lot of people with injuries, back garden injuries, bicycles coming over the handlebar, which is quite big at the moment. And then the freakish injuries where they kicked something in the garden, missed, kicked themselves against a wire, or fell over the dog, that kind of thing. Right. Okay. But very much walking wounded people out yeah. there doing their one hour of exercise and not making it through that hour. Yeah, I've done one knee operation in the last five weeks. Okay, and what was that? That was a locked knee in a 23-year-old girl for a bucket handle lateral discal tear. Okay, so that would constitute an orthopedic emergency. That yeah. point is at risk. There's implications of long-term poor outcomes if we don't do something. Yeah, so she couldn't, uh, true locked knee, she can't extend your knee because the meniscus is trapped inside. Okay. And you have to reduce the meniscus and repair it. We know, and we'll talk about it later, maybe on the lateral meniscus in particular, mm -hmm. if you um, don't repair it or you um, or you chop it out, yeah, then you're going to get arthritis early on. Yeah, fair enough. And like we say, you know, our tagline is save the joint, save the meniscus. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. So look, you know, what constitutes, you, you, you sort of said, a locked knee, lateral meniscal tear in a young active patient. Yeah. What other scenarios would you encourage patients to come for in the COVID pandemic to A&E or an emergency case regarding the knee? Okay, so if we go back to what I said about what are the causes of a 
of a blood in the knee. So normally, in the normal circumstances, you're referring them both or all. So fracture and yeah. extensive the mechanism. So if you hurt your knee, you fall down the stairs, you get kicked in the knee, you're hit by a car, don't be scared to go to A&E. Yeah. Obviously, people at this risk that A&E is full of coronavirus. And But we as doctors and hospitals know that's a real concern for patients. Uh, we won't be seeing you in the coronavirus zones, but we will try and assess you. But someone with an extensive mechanism disruption, which means they cannot straight leg raise, that's the... That's the key factor on assessing these patients. Right. Because uh, um, to straight leg raise, you need an intact quad tendon, an intact patella tendon, and an intact patella. Yeah. Right. So if you don't have a straight leg raise or you cannot wait there, you need an x ray and you need assessment. So your legs That's... doing the big buckling, you can't walk yeah. on that, leg, swollen. Those are yeah. serious concerns. Correct. And that would need urgent attention surgically even in COVID times. Right. That and a locked lateral meniscal tear, yep. like a handle tear, locked knee, okay. would also consider that. Okay. ACL, PCL, MCL, LCL, OA, patella dislocations, all those can wait. Okay. They can be safely parked yep. with relatively urgent attention. Okay. But not... But one other thing I just wanted to touch on, we're doing injured knee and worn knee, but um, the other thing that could potentially fall through the gap is septic knee. So yeah. just take us through that as an emergency, if you don't mind, please. Yeah, so someone with a red hot uh, knee without, without trauma, so it's not blood, uh, they're feeling unwell, sweaty, features of a fever, then... Um, and an exquisitely painful joint. Yeah. Uh, septic arthritis is very, very painful. Then that is an emergency. We need to wash those bugs out of your joint. Yeah. Or you can take that out and you need antibiotics. Right. So, so it's not just coronavirus knee. that's out there that can cause these Correct. things. Right. So and other diseases are present. So, yeah. yeah. Often caused by bacteria, as you know. Yeah. And, it, and it, it, it's, not, it's not seasonal. No, no. So, um, so, yeah, that is the, the non-injured part of what we're doing urgently as well. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. So, look, let's, let's have a chat a little bit about ligaments now. You know, in the main ligament, the, the star ligament of the knee could be called the ACL, the cruciate ligament. So, why don't you take us a bit through diagnosis, history examination, investigations, your sort of rationale and take on this. So, the ACL. Okay, so as you know, it's my bread and butter. I do quite a lot. And I do a lot of children on this. And we run an acute knee clinic, and time and time again, I suppose the history is the answer. People will tell you they have torn their ACL without yeah. even using those words. And the history is classical. It's a non-contact twisting injury on a pitch, whatever pitch, football, basketball, baseball, um, anything. Okay, non-contact pivoting injury normally. Yeah, netball as well. Netball, hockey. Yeah, it's not uh, a gender specific thing, is it? No, but they, they can't complete they, they they have a non contact pivot, they feel something go. Yeah, they may or may not hear a pop, it's not that crucial. Um but what they have is an acute swelling and, and an unable to continue activity, an inability to continue. And that is an ACL. So we can see patients now. I go, when did you injure your knee? I injured it in November. What happened? I was playing football. I just twisted my knee. I, you know, I felt something go in my knee and it just felt wobbly. Did you play on? No, I didn't. I couldn't. That's an ACL. Yeah, fine. And you turn to the patient, you go, you tore your ACL. And they go, how do you know? And they go, because you just told me. Yes, exactly. Fine. Okay. And the, the other one is skiing. Right. So she went skiers. I know we've just wiped out an entire ski season almost. Yeah. But skiers, they twist, they fall, their bindings didn't release, the knee went one way, the skis went the other. Yeah. They can't ski down, they need the blood wagon to help them down, and that's again a typical ACL. They didn't ski on for the rest of the trip. Yeah, fine. And like you say, you know, the skiers needed the blood wagon. Uh, a lot of players, you find they were needed help to be taken off the pitch. That was basically game over at that point. Mm. Yeah, the game over, 
and th th that's the diagnosis. They try and um, they try and carry on. They can't. They try and settle down. It's acutely painful. ACLs are only painful for about seven to ten days. Okay. So the patients get through it and go, yeah, well, my knee was starting to feel better. I could walk. You know, after a couple of weeks, you know, they learn to compensate for their for their instability. And um, so, when when do they come and see you then? Uh, so it varies. They either yeah. come a week later because we run an acute knee clinic in the NHS and in the private sector, or they come a few months later and and. Often that is associated with further giving way where they've torn their meniscus. Right. Okay. Yeah. And what are you going to do at that point? Let's say we're non-COVID time and then give us a sort of COVID, you know, a remote access sort of outline on how you progress now. Okay. So we assess the patient. The history is quite clear and you can even do that remotely yeah. uh, and listen to the patients on the phone. The obviously in, in, uh, in another world, we examine the patient. Yes. Uh, which is quite crucial for an ACL. And there's, there's three tests which are quite quite, quite classical. Okay. So obviously, I'll always do the straight leg raise first just to make sure they haven't got an extensive mechanism issue. Yeah. Um, and then we'll do the anterior draw, or which I don't really do acutely, or the Lachman test, or a uh, pivot shift. Mm hmm um i've got a couple of videos when i have a look at those or yeah if you don't mind that. i think that'd be really useful to see yeah please. let's see how this works tell me if you get a good yeah. view of issue yeah so, i think that's a good view there so what that's the that's the lachman test one hand okay. firmly fixing the femur about 30 yeah. degrees and you're pulling the um tibia forward this is a intraoperative view of a, a lachman and a pivot shift um wow that's a big so you can really see that translation sort of coming forward of the tibia on the femur. Yeah. And you can That's hear it. the pivot here. Listen. Wow. Okay. Okay. It's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit hard to hear. And then we've got another one here, which is again, a theater one. It's the pivot shift. And there is the tibia being subluxed anteriorly, then put them pushed back. Okay, and people say, can you do it in a weight patient? This is one in clinic. And you've got a, a nice pivot. Yeah. And that's the knee subluxed backwards um, from a um, from a subluxed position. That's a clear ACL pivot shift. Right, so good. And that's something you do routinely in clinic. You've basically got 95% diagnosis at that point. Yeah. So the MRI, which is the X-ray and MRI, which is my next investigation, yes, is the MRI is not to diagnose the ACL; it's to diagnose what else has been torn. Okay, I'll talk about meniscus later, but the meniscus is key to all this, mm -hmm. and whether we need to do anything to the chondral surface or the meniscus to repair. So it's about quantifying damage, managing patient expectations, communicating that to the patient, yeah, so that yeah. they know and realise what's happening. Absolutely. Um, and then I suppose after that, really, you're, you, we're going to trial conservative tri treatments. You're going to be where are you going to send them, and what are you going to say uh, on what you can do and how much can you do? Okay, so an isolated ACL you can treat non-operatively, and we have, um, you know, we have guidelines for that. If people mm -hmm. are not very sporty and don't rely on pivot sports, yeah, you get the order, the order. Your dad, who just comes out once a year for the father and son egg and spoon race or whatever, they're sat in there and, and right. they injure their knee and they don't do any other sports or Xbox injuries. They don't okay. necessarily need an ACL reconstruction. Yeah. And in fact, with amazing rehab, uh, people with an isolated ACL can manage. Yeah. What we do know, though, is that if you're going to do pivoting sports, and if you do regular pivoting sports and have ongoing instability, then you're at higher risk of um, of tearing your meniscus. Yes. And uh, if tearing the meniscus leads to meniscectomies, leads to arthritis, which is what we discussed earlier. And as you did your fellowship in Sydney as well, they did a review of uh, 5,000 ACLs. And they worked out that if you, um, if you waited six months 
um, you doubled your chance of a meniscal tear. Okay. And if you waited 12 months, that went up six times. Mm -hmm. You were six times more likely to tear your meniscus. And if you're under 20, those figures doubled. So if you're a teenager, 19 year old, and you wait, you're going to get meniscal damage if your knee continues to give way. Right. So in, in Australia, they consider five months to be chronic. Okay. In Japan, five weeks considered to be chronic. <laughs> and uh, the mean time to surgery in the UK is 12 months, private and NHS. Right, okay. So we're, we're a bit behind. Yeah, so it sounds like it. Okay, so what what are, you, what are you going to say to your patient? What can you do? What can't you do? Are you going to send you know? Are you going to send them for physio? Are you going to tell them on? Yeah, uh, so strengthen that. I think, that I think the concept of prehabilitation is very important. Yeah, so you want to get the knee quiet before you operate. Immediately before the surgery, you need the knee to be quiet, and after the surgery, you want the knee to be quiet. Okay, okay and that's where our rehab colleagues come in. Okay, so getting the swelling down, we can talk about ice compression machines pre and post uh, surgery, get the knee moving. It's mm -hmm. key is to get the knee straight before and after surgery if you can. Yeah, okay. Protect any structures if you need to, brace the medial ligament, etc. But the key is to get the knee quiet, get the knee feeling normal, as normal as it can be. Get them to the point where they. They want to doubt whether you need the surgery or not because the only tests that are positive are the instability tests. Okay. And, and th there used to be, I don't know if this is historic, about going in too early and ending up with a stiff knee, you know, off, literally off the slopes. Um, is, that, is that something that's a concern at all? Yeah. So if you go in too early you, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an acutely inflamed knee, you mm -hmm. still, still risk um, arthrofibrosis, scar tissue. And uh, that can have quite negative implications. But I think with modern rehab techniques, aggressive use of ice, people being braced from the slopes yeah. or splinted, more faster access to us, then we can um, advise the patients accordingly, get the knee quiet. And you can get the knee fairly quiet within a month and even two and a half, three weeks yeah. um, quiet enough. Okay, and that's an MDT, multidisciplinary approach. You've got your yeah. teams, you've got your orthotics or bracing teams, all yeah. of these several people helping out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just take us through the surgery now, um, you know, and also I'd like to know what your take on allograft versus using hamstrings or BTB as well. Okay, I've just seen an interesting yes. question there. Yeah. So what um, results off of people? ACL within 48 hours. Um, that's a very good question. I'd, I'd like to think it wasn't purely financial, um, but there's a reason that um, that knee surgery theatre is positioned at the bottom of the ski slopes. Exactly. Yeah, um, and we can talk later maybe about ACL repair, which is the new vogue and new excuse for doing um Yes. Uh, do it. Yes, yeah, someone's just written they want money. Yeah, I think someone's uh, hit the nail on the head. But we can talk about repair later. Sorry, sorry, Rich, what was the question I got sidetracked there? What so I, I want to know what your take on allograft is routine use versus hamstrings or BTB. What's your surgery? What do you do? Okay, so my default still is hamstrings, but I do quite a lot of patellar tendon, particularly in revision surgery. Okay. I think, uh, I think patellar tendons are probably a touch more solid, uh, but so I might use them for my rugby players or my sprinters who need speed. Okay. Okay. That'd be tough. If you lose your hamstrings a little bit, you can yeah. you can have a, an impact on your speed. Um, basketballers, uh, netballers, they might not want their patellar tendon taken as for jumping and landing. Uh, okay then I might use hamstrings. So a bit wow. of art. Okay. So when do you use, uh, we'll come to um, Stanwall Physio, we'll come to sort of post-op rehab and things like that later on. Um, so when do you use allograft? Do you use allograft? Yeah, so allograft is an option. Okay. Uh, 
tell you that the, that the issues with allograft historically have been, um, you know, obviously the fear of infection and spread of viruses and stuff. But nowadays they're so uh, well controlled, well managed. Mm -hmm. We can get any allograft we want and um, joint operations are one of the, um, the country's leading providers of the, the allograft. And um, they're all safe. You can go and watch these being manufactured and prepared. And the, the, you know, the risk of uh, infection is is negligible. Right, right. all infections. So yeah. Yeah, definitely they're all screened for Hep B, Hep C, HIV, all the other things we're concerned about. I'm not sure how well they're screened for COVID-19, but coronavirus, but I'm fairly certain they will be. Yeah. Um, and they're treated. So when are they good? They are good in patients who are perhaps lower demand. That's one. Okay. Well, that's more vogue, so people our age, I suppose, Rishi, people uh, who are not going to be as highly explosive pivoting-wise on their knee. Okay. okay? Um, but my default would be an autograft right. uh, yep. uh, in most patients. But it becomes an option in the middle age, the weekend warrior, the person having day-to-day -day instability, but mm -hmm. isn't high demand. The other right. people is obviously for multiple ligaments, dislocated knees, where we run out of hamstrings, yeah. uh, uh, run out of quads tendons, run, run out of patella tendons, then, then allograft is an option. You need that real estate, sure. Okay, and let's talk about ALL. What is ALL? Okay, so what we found is with a standard ACL reconstruction, mm -hmm. there is still a significant re-rupture rate. Okay. And the re-rupture rate can be, I think the figures quoted are about 10 to 11%. I looked at my first thousand, I remember discussing this with you, my re-rupture rate for my first thousand was 3.6%, which is very good. Mm -hmm. um, but we can do better. And Al Get Good in Canada, as part of a, a multi-center study, looked at the lateral Tenodesis, the lateral extra articular tenodesis, the LET. I can okay. show you that in a second. And yep. they reduced their rate of re rupture from 11% to 4%. Wow. Right. So if I can decrease my re rupture rate by 4%, wow. uh, by the threefold, then, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Yes. So I do a lateral extra articular tenodesis in people who are at a higher risk of re rupture. And what group is they that? Are, okay. All children. Okay. All children from five years old to 20 year olds. Okay. They get a, um, to, they get a higher, higher, they get a, a lateral procedure. All revisions. Yeah. People who have got hypermobility or hyperlaxity. Okay. And people on x ray or MRI scan that have got a high tibial slope. Right, it leads itself to ACL um, AP instability. They're the ones off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, any elite level sportsman will get lateral tenodesis as well. Okay, fine. Um, let's run, shall I run through that on a? Shall I try? And yeah, get go on. Let's have a look. Yeah, let, if you've got some images of that, that'll be nice because you know it's uh, as you say. So whilst we're bringing those up, can I ask you: Is there a difference between your pediatric ACL uh, rupture rate versus adults? Is there a difference there? Yes, there is. So the pediatric re rupture rate again depends on children and levels of puberty. So the pre pubertal children, the Tanner one and two, we call it, uh, mm -hmm. no, no evidence of puberty, their, their risk of re rupture is very high, very high. It's almost guaranteed. You can imagine if you put any kind of ligament in there and they haven't even gone through their growth spurt, that as they grow, the, the ligament stretches. It might right. not be rupture, but it becomes loose like an overstretched elastic band. Okay. As they hit post puberty and the further they go away from puberty, their, their, their risk of re rupture is um, higher than adults, but approaching more adults. So, a 15 okay. year old, well, maybe I'd say a, a one in two chance, although the, right. the, 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 the books say 25% re rupture rate in all children. Yeah, across okay. the board. And, and I do do, yeah, in terms of surgery, 
we try and avoid their growth plates, obviously. Okay, so it's extra articular, as in growth plates preserving, so you don't Correct. breach the growth plate. Yeah, I could just try and show you something. Mm -hmm. This is an adult ACL, actually, but I can give you an idea. Okay. Oh, so this is a standard adult ACL. Yep. And the femoral tunnel is here. Yes. Okay, and this line here across is where the growth plate would be. Yep. So we would use techniques just to lower that tunnel a little bit and go below. Right, so it's under that physeal scar, under the growth plate, going a bit more lateral so that you avoid yeah. any injury. Okay, great. Okay, and then the lateral tenodesis, give me two seconds. Okay. This is from Al Gekgaard's paper. This is um, the lateral side of the knee. Okay. Okay, so five to six centimeter incision. You get a strip of the iliotibial band. Right. Put a few stitches in it here. Okay, and this structure here yeah. is the LCL. Right. And this LCL band is okay. tucked under the LCL and then fixed with a staple. It's a lateral procedure. Okay. Okay. And it's a lateral extra tenodesis. And if I can show you that diagrammatically, mm -hmm. all right, this is a complicated picture, but this is a strip of the ITB. Yeah. This is the LCL coming down. We take the strip and tuck it under the LCL and fix it here. Right. So that's an additional sort of uh, stirrup hold of the tibia onto the lateral femoral condyle with a staple. Correct. And it's similar, but not exactly similar, to an ALL, which is okay. a question you asked me, which is that structure, which is the anterior lateral ligament, which is yep. just behind and uh, proximal posterior to lateral epicondyle, midway between Gerdes tubercle and the fibular head, just below the joint line. But that's superficial to the LCL. And the French and the, um, the Europeans have had good results with the ALL. Okay. Um, the US market, the Canadians, the, the UK is more towards the lateral extra articular tenodesis, but adding something on the lateral side has been shown to be beneficial. Right. You need to be careful here in this area in children. So, in children, I do that, which is I take a strip of the ITB, tuck it under the LCL, and just sew it over itself so there's no fixation around the growth plate. So you're not breaching anything near that area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. And so let's go on to the ACL repair versus reconstruction. What's the difference? Okay. So things come and go in orthopedics. We discussed metal and metal resurfacing last week, didn't we? And how that swung out of favor and came back. So ACL repair was done a few, well, many years ago, I think, when we were... Very young. Okay, uh, I don't even remember. Those. Yeah, well, neither do I. But the, um, <laughs> there was close close to a fifty percent failure rate. Okay, right. Um, and Catherine, I'll come to your question in a minute. The um, fifty percent failure rate, but now newer techniques um, using internal bracing, um, which is common in. Uh, US, U UK markets, and also the ligaments is another one okay. um, on the ski slopes. The ACL repair has become more on vogue, in vogue, sorry. Um, but there has been higher failure rates, particularly in children. All right, and what, how, what are you repairing? The, is it a mid ligament rupture? Is it coming off the femur, the tibia? Um... So, femur, tibia, the black pen is the ACL. Okay. Okay. If the ACL comes off the femur, pretty much whole. Right. We can put some stitches in the end, tie it back to the femur. Yeah. And then with another ligament, the internal brace gives it a little bit of support. Right. And then, okay. and then yeah, allows yeah. The, the, the pen to heal back. Yes. The ACL. And then we take the ligament out and we're left with the ACL. Fantastic. And the people I use it in. Uh, yeah. For acute injuries, in for me, children who right. are prepubescent, yeah, who are active with a big lacman, a big pivot shift, and you know, wait, wait, where you're limited in choice, 
of graft options. Yes. Uh, Allograft is a relative contraindication in children. And I suppose with a higher re-rupture rate, you kind of want to use that tissue as many times as possible. Um, do you think yeah. there's anything in pre proprioception as well with that preservation of the ACL? Yeah, there is. And as you know, um, even in adult reconstructions of ACL, there's more... Um, uh, we try and preserve the remnant of the ACL yeah. uh, for that very reason. Okay. And then afterwards, are you gonna, how are you going to tell what you're going to tell the patient about post-op rehab? What's their gonna, activity levels going to be? What can they do? What can't they do? How long is it going to take? Uh, the operation going to take. How long does the operation take? Uh, the operation will take about a straightforward ACL. Well, yeah, um, not long is the answer, 30, 40 minutes. Okay. Um, and and, and what, what happens? Do I have a brace afterwards? Okay, so let's go through rehab. Um, the question was, what was the procedure called? It's called a lateral extraarticular tenodesis, an LET. And that's one procedure or an ALL, anterior lateral ligament repair. That's another procedure, but they're similar. Um, okay, so rehab. Okay, so the perfect rehab for me is the people, the patients will go in an ice compression de device. Right. Uh, Physiolab is the one I currently use. Very good. Um, it, re it goes on in recovery. Um, it allows ice on compression. And it really limits how much, um, how much painkillers patients need. So okay. reduce the need for opiates. My patients are on simple analgesia um, and, I mean, paracetamol and Nurofen. Right. So they just go home with simple analgesia. They're so, happy. yeah. Go on. They hire that for a month. It gets delivered to the house. It's very good. Um, just be aware of people with patellofemoral problems, chondromalacia, um, or articular problems on the patella. They don't love it. They don't love the compression aspect of Right. Um, ice, ice machines, but generally the vast majority of people respond very well to um, uh, ice compression. Okay. Um, go on. So they go home, crutches, ice compression, painkillers. Uh, just take us briefly through what their recovery looks like. What are you asking them to do? Okay, so myself, the patient, the, the physios, the rehab specialists need to get the patient quiet the knee quiet as soon as possible. Okay. And by quiet, I mean get the swelling down and get the knee straight. That is an issue currently. The lack of hands-on physio for patients who have had surgery. So the, the, the week before lockdown, for me, yeah. those patients um, are struggling by the lack of uh, hands-on physiotherapy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's the same. Absolutely. So, the physios need to get, get their hands on the patient, help them with their extension exercises and get their knee quiet. Getting the knee straight is of paramount importance, uh, but full extension. So I'd expect my patients to be walking in with no limb two weeks after surgery. Okay, right. That's, that's the, the first milestone. Uh, by six weeks, almost full bend. Yeah. Um, there's no need for a brace for routine ACL surgery. Okay. I think having a brace actually can inhibit your extension. Right, yeah. People tend to overuse it. They're very good. People with a brace are very happy to bend their knee, but locking the knee out straight becomes a problem. So it's, even if the patient has a million braces or can afford it, or, you know, it's, it's actually it's detrimental in terms of um, achieving that final extension. Right. Um, so, yeah, no, no, no indication for bracing unless we're doing an adjunctive procedure, meniscal repair, microfracture, control injury. And return to play for field sport. Yes, yeah, so I just want to touch base on this. So, it's not time based anymore. So, mm -hmm. the physios and the patients have to find a, a rehab protocol that suits them, be adaptable, and be prepared to switch. I think a lot of people use the Melbourne ACL rehab protocol. It's a good baseline. Um, but 
you know, typically it was like two weeks fully straight, getting on a bike ASAP. So I'd get the patients on the bike as soon as possible, actually static bike. Get yeah. him on an outdoor, outdoor bike for six weeks, get him jogging with the physio three months, running four months, okay. uh, jumping plyometric six months, back to court eight months and back on the pitch soon after. However, if you, if you, uh, I was asking one of the local physios, Activate Rehab, they use isokinetic strength thing and strength and they test everyone at uh, four months and they found that at four months, there's still uh, a quads and hamstring deficit of 35%. Right, okay. Which is too high for running. Yeah. So you want a quads and hamstring deficit of about 20%. And so that might be another, that might be five months. So right. Don't go horses for courses. Don't, you know, do go horses for courses. Don't go, right, four months, let's run. Because it might be too yeah. soon. Right. Okay, so, yeah. Typically, you can do uh, calf work, tiptoe, uh, jogging, three months, but proper running, you're looking maybe four or five months. Fine. And, that, and that's the real, the real get out the patients are looking for. When, once they've done a proper run, they feel, they feel they're getting over it. Yeah. And then back to sports, they must, everyone must do a return to sports testing. Yes. They must do, um, they must pass that. They must practice again before they play a game. Right. Um, ideally, isometric testing or isokinetic strength, uh, testing. But if they can't do that, do all the lateral hop tests. Find a good uh, return to sport criteria you want to do and pass mm. it, smash it, and, and do well. Um, don't be scared of wearing a brace back for your first ski season. Right. Okay. Um, it, it's, a, it's a good thing to get you through the psychology of getting back to something that where you're injured, you need. And um, and obviously you touched on it last week. Uh, pet FIFA eleven plus. Make sure you get your pre prevention in, particularly yeah. for children, particularly for adults on the other side. We know you've got a ten to fourteen percent chance of re rupturing your other ligaments. Right. And yeah. The prevention. Oh, doing yeah. those exercises <laughs> are really good. Nordic hamstring test from six months. Make sure your hamstrings are up to it. So yeah, that's a, a little bit on rehab. The other common question on rehab we get asked about is complex uh, quad stimulation. So people who've had a, a medial ligament or an MCL or something on the medial retinaculum where they have a, a VMO weakness, yes. then uh, a complex might help in those patients. Right. Okay, fine. So look, um, I want to move on now. We're going to talk about saving the meniscus because um, I know that's, pretty much a sort of logo that uh, um, you'd probably agree with and um, you sort of fought for. So um, just tell me, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? So yeah. the big deal is if we chop out your lateral meniscus, you will get signs of symptomatic OA within five years. Okay. And that is from what age? What's irrelevant of age? No, well, the younger, the, the, the younger, the more active you are, yeah. Then the higher risk, the more obese you are, the higher risks. Okay. You know, yeah. If you're a six foot six bloke and weigh 18 stone, we chop out your lateral meniscus, you're not going to do very well. Okay. So the medial meniscus is much more progressive, takes time. Um, um, someone's asking what exercise I do. I use a lot of bike. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the medial meniscus. You know, it can be a 10, 15, 20 year progress. To okay. Generate. But the lateral is vital. That is Correct. well documented and like you say. Okay. Correct. So you would then repair this at all costs or whenever, whenever possible? No. So again, there's been a lot of discussion about meniscus and whether knee surgeons are doing too much arthroscopic meniscectomies. Okay, yeah. And I'm going to go to, I'm going to show you a slide which sums up the role of arthroscopy and, um, and meniscus. And it comes down to if your knee has a traumatic injury and you've yeah. torn your meniscus, okay, mm -hmm. the, the best treatment there is a meniscal repair. Okay? Yeah. So I'm going to show you a slide. 
if you think of the meniscus as a pair of shoes, right? Yeah. If you've got an on the on this picture here, yeah, you've got a brand new pair of boots. You go out on a Friday night, you trip on the ang trip on the pavement, and the heel comes off. You're going to take it back, or you're going to get it repaired, okay? And you're going to get that go to the cobblers and get that heel fitted, and yeah. that's what this meniscal repair is. These stitches, you want to put the the, the meniscus back, pristine surfaces and get it sutured back. Okay. That's a medium meniscus and a lateral meniscus, even more urgent. Right. That's a ripped shoe. And so is this. This is a, a ripped trainer, a yep. tall meniscus. And that's what the meniscus looks like. There's no arthritis, but it's yep. still a degenerative meniscus. Okay. This is smoothing over partial meniscectomy. This is a meniscal repair. Relatively urgent meniscal repair, never urgent. These okay. guys, you can wait three months, physiotherapy, painkillers, injections if you're feeling good, or do nothing, yeah? Yeah. The patient, let the knee settle down. Can be a, um, a normal finding in many 50-year-olds, middle-aged people can have meniscal tears. Mm -hmm. A bit like cuff tears, yeah? Grey yeah. hair, cuff tear equals meniscal tear, yeah? That's the, the, right. uh, the, 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 okay? And, but if you tear your meniscus, has there been trauma? Then you are in need of a meniscal repair as soon as possible. Okay. And the reason okay. is, if you have your meniscus taken out, the risk of OA goes up 14 times. Right. So traumatic versus degenerative is where I want to go with the meniscus. And that's why we preserve the meniscus. And that's why in COVID times, if you have a bucket handle lateral meniscal tear, you're getting it. Urgent. Right. That is urgent. Fine. Okay. So, fine. Um, anything else you wanted to mention on the meniscus from that point of view? Uh, no, I, I'm just checking there's no more questions there. Um, no. But... Um, no, there's other tears, root tears we repair, ramp tears we repair. You don't need to know what the details of what they are, but we repair meniscus not only to give the knee a cushion, but the meniscus does offer the knee stability. Okay, yes. So if we remove your meniscus, your knee will become unstable. So it's a mechanical disadvantage. Correct. Actually, yeah. kind of what you showed about the heel was a major mechanical failure. Whereas yeah. the old shoes, outer edge, pressing and fraying, as you say, big difference between urgency and non-urgency. Yeah. Okay. So traumatic tears, repair. Degenerative tears, take your time. There's no such thing as an urgent partial meniscectomy. No. Fine. Yes. Fine. All right. So you mentioned, uh, you know, the patella. Let's have a... Uh, chat about patella problems uh what sort of patients do you see patella dislocations or patella uh pain syndrome in okay so patella femoral dislocation much more common in children okay uh, 10 to 17 year ago much more common in women uh there is a genetic component and it is a problem um so if you dislocate your kneecap uh, it's nearly always traumatic the first time your risk of dislocation um, goes up significantly. So 17% for the first time dislocator, 50% for recurrent dislocators. And a number of risk factors we look at um, can, do, can predict who is going to fail or who is going to re-dislocate. Okay. So who are you worried about? So who are we worried about? We are worried about People who are young, who are bilateral dislocators. Wow. Okay. People who have a, um, a strong genetic uh, component. People who've got hyperlaxity. Mm -hmm. People who, if you think of the kneecap sitting in a, the groove of the trochlea, almost like an egg in an egg cup. Yeah. Or a bobsleigh in a bobsleigh track. The bobsleigh yeah. is the patella. The, the, the track is the trochlear groove. People who have a shallow trochlea. Right. Okay, I'll try and show you a picture. It's, um, it's going to slip out quite easily. Correct. But um, people who've got maltracking, I'll show you the miserable malalignment of what, what we're talking about patella-wise. Yeah. Uh, young girls whose uh, 
whose knees look like this. So the picture here on this side, the kneecaps are squinting, pointing to each other. Yeah. If you want the kneecaps to point out, you've got to do that with the feet, which is Charlie Chaplin. Now that the kneecaps are facing forward. They suffer from patellofemoral pain. They suffer from increased chances of patellofemoral dislocation. Mm -hmm. If I go to this picture now and hit the video, this is what we call the J sign. The patella comes like a J right. as you go into extension. All right? That yeah. is mouth tracking of your kneecap. This young girl, she's 13. I did an MPFL, medial patellofemoral ligament. And you can yeah. see the tracking, the J sign has been eliminated on that side. Okay. The other, right. people we do, the other people we worry about, Rishi, is if, let me, if I can just if it's the next picture, oh, I'm not going to show that, is people whose kneecaps do that. So they, they, they this, this is the same picture of the girl with the squinting kneecaps, they're right. in valgus, the femur is rotated internally, the tibia yeah. is rotated, the foot is overpronated, and this is the, the miserable malrotated uh, lower limb that leads to patellofemoral pain. Yeah, I think it's a similar thing for the ITB as well. Um, yeah, fine. Um, all right, so what sort of assessments are you doing graphically for this? Okay, so the people we're worried about are, when we ask for imaging, we're looking for x-rays, and we're looking at MRI scans nowadays. You can get CT, but MRI. And on those features, I am looking for uh any any bone osteochondral defects so when the kneecap came out and came back did they knock yeah. anything off okay um they're gonna we're looking at their whether their growth plates are fused uh i'm looking at how shallow their trochlea is right okay the bony stability we're looking at how high their kneecap is because right. that's this factor patella alta so number one trochlea dysplasia Number two, patella alta. I'm looking at how much tilt there is in the kneecap, and I'm looking at the MPFL. Right. Okay, so the MPFL is interesting because the MPFL is a ligament, if I can show you. Uh, MPFL is a, a soft tissue ligament. And, and how often is that involved? So if, no matter what the scan says, it's involved 100% yeah. of the time. Right. So if the kneecap pops out, let me show you. Yeah. The MPFL must have torn or stretched. Yeah. Sorry, mate. One second. No problem. So here's the kneecap. Okay. Yeah. Come over the slide. This is yes. the MPFL. Right. So it's, right. Right. it's not, it's not broken. No. Okay. But it's gone. So you assume the MPFL is gone when you have a dislocated kneecap. Okay. But we can have a look at it on the... Um, on the MRI scan and the MPFL can pull a chunk of bone off and stuff, we can fix those back. All right. So let's say you get a phone call. This 18 year old girl's had her first dislocation. You're on the phone now. What are you going to sort of manage? How are you going to manage that? So, first time dislocation, no bony defects, rehab, rehab, get the knee quiet, get the muscles strong, lots yeah. of physiotherapy, regain the confidence. Well, I do get an MRI scan to make sure we can predict in terms of risk factors how likely they are to um, how likely they are to tear again and pop their knee again um, because then we and the physiotherapists can get our heads together and help counsel the patient and how the importance of physio and doing the exercises on a on a, a long term basis is more important. Okay. First time dislocators, unless you're an elite athlete or you've knocked some bone off or a chunk of cartilage, then I'm probably going to treat you non-operatively. Right. And that's a brace or an um, limited movement? So we can brace them for the first seven to 10 days, gives the patient a bit of confidence, allows them to get a straight leg raise back, you know, more confident, no, no quads lag. And if they've got no quads lag, you can get rid of the brace, get the muscle, get the ice, get the swelling down and get the strength going and get the, yeah, get the strength going. Okay, so and movement wise, you're not yeah, moving. So it's either stable or it's not stable. Okay, so once it goes back, the, the, the patients will actively avoid any activities or pivoting which they think will destabilize the kneecap. 
Okay. Yeah, so they do need that reassurance for it to die down for the first few days, get the swelling down, okay, have the confidence, they meet us, we reassure them they're going to be okay. You might give them a little patella stabilizing brace, you'll get their knee iced, you'll get the physio going, you get them straight leg exercises, get that quads back, and, uh, and, then, and then the rehab starts. Okay, right, fine. Have you ever seen a medial dislocation? Does that actually exist? It does exist. I've seen one. I didn't believe it. So I took him to theatre to prove yeah. it was a, a medial dislocator. And you can do a lateral, like a medial uh, MPFL. You can do a lateral retinacular. Right. Okay. Fine. And when you're doing your operation, what, what is, what's your algorithm or what are your options? Because there used to be the tubal tuberosity transfers, the trochleoplasty, MPFLs, where are you with all of um, the options? Okay, so when your knee is in full extension, that's when you test apprehension, okay? Okay. And when your knee is very dislocatable or, or, or lacks an extension, you have to consider the MPFL. So it's very rare we don't do the MPFL. Yeah, okay. okay. As you go through flexion, that we, when we, what we do know is when your knee is fully straight, your kneecap is not engaged in the trochlea. Yeah, it sits above it. Yeah, so if your kneecap pops an extension, then doing something to the trochlea is pretty much irrelevant. If your kneecap pops out while the knee is engaged, i.e. from 30 degrees to 60 degrees, mm -hmm. and you can test the apprehension during this, then you're looking at some more trochlea-based procedure. Right. A trochlea blasty where you deepen the groove. Um, if the kneecap pops out at 90 degrees, then there's often this rotation problem we were talking about on the femur and tibia. Okay. All right. So my, my, the arrows in my quiver for kneecaps are MPFL. Yeah. If the kneecap is high, I'll distalize the kneecap. Okay. Okay. So and bring that's... it down rather than medialize. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, so traditionally, they medialize the uh, the kneecap for procedures, but it might not. Have, it might never have been the tibial tubercle that was lateral. It might be that the trochlear groove was medial. Yes, and that's why the TTTG was raised. Okay. All right. So you know, you, you might you may not have taken the good bit of where the tubercle was mm. and shifting it. So distalizing the tubercle is a good procedure. Yeah. MPFL is a very good procedure. Trochlear plasty is a fantastically Brilliant procedure for the patients, but it's probably the hardest operation I do. Right. Um, and a double derotation osteotomy is technically challenging to get it perfectly right. And quite a big and invasive procedure. Yeah, you, have to, you have to break both legs, the femur and tibia, and right. rotate them. Yeah. You do have to do a pretty desperate patient to want something like that. Correct. No, fair enough. Okay. Well, look, I, you know... Um, uh, that's been a pretty comprehensive uh, view on on um, that, those scenarios. Um, is there anything else you wanted to mention or answer questions on that we had at the moment? I think there's some questions on ACL repair um, on the slopes. Yeah. And someone asked me about stem cells. I don't know whether you can have a look at Was there any other questions? Which yeah, I think it was Ken's physio mentioned stem cell and ACL repair. Um, and then there was, so let's talk about that. Stem cells. So there is no evidence to, to support the use of PRP or stem cells as an adjunct in surgery. Okay. You and I both use it in the hip or in a, if I'm doing a chondral procedure, when I'm doing a meniscal transplant, I will soak it in PRP. Okay, before I implant it, the patient's PRP. But there is no evidence to support it. Okay, like we know, we, we know there's some uh, basic level 12-month evidence to support PRP in inflammatory conditions. We also know that in OA, it gives some relief up to a year. But in the medium term onwards, there's, yeah. no, there's no proven benefit as of such. No. But if you are doing a procedure which is reliant on blood supply or the body's environment to heal, such as meniscal repair, 
meniscal transplant, if you're considering an ACL repair, then yeah. adding an adjunct, getting blood in the knee, getting stem cells of, or any kind into the knee won't do any harm. Sure. What we do know about stem cell injections and PRP injections is they have a very low risk profile. Yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're relatively safe. Yes. However, whether they're effective or not is yet to be proven. No, sure. Fair enough. Do you agree with that? Or? Yeah, I think, I th yeah, I think there is, um, I, I think there, over the next few years, there will be growing evidence coming out there um, on the adjuncts and how they work. So it'll be an interesting thing to look at. But like you said, yeah. the risk benefit profile is low. Uh, the idea of augmenting it with uh, the patient's own biology, um, the, the risks are very low and there may be some perceived benefits which may may help. So it's a good, good thing to, to have if necessary. Okay. On the, um, on the ACL repair, I think an ACL repair is not an urgent operation in terms of it should be done on the ski slopes. Yeah. I think you've always got time to get back. I think you've always got time to breathe, get to that seven, 10 days of, you know, where the knee feels a bit better. Yeah. Calm the knee down. Range of movement. I think you should really think hard about whether the ACL repair is what you need because I think the gold standard for an adult and any athlete, an ACL repair is definitely not for an athlete. Not for an athlete. Right. Okay. Because um, the re-rupture rates are so high. So you have time. I think there is a, I think there is a, a, a scope or a place for ACL repair. But um, um, uh, yeah, I think for me, in my hands, a very clear pull-off and maybe in a child. Okay. Uh, some other questions coming up. I think Ryan Mackey touched on the Tim Hewitt paper for rehab, which is why we are moving away from time. And it, it showed that even in the year one to two group that the ACL had not healed to the bone, particularly so in allograft patients. So if you have an allograft ACL reconstruction, you are much more likely to rehab and have the, the, the ligament healing to you, what we're trying to do when we put an ACL is we want the ACL to heal to the body. Yeah. So we take your hamstrings out, your patella tendon out, your quads tendon out. You want that remodeling. Your allergy, yeah. Pop it back and you want that ligament to heal to you. When it's fully healed, fully matured, your knee is stable. Okay. And what they're saying is it could be well one to two years now. So don't go on time, which is we talk, talked about this earlier. Make yeah. sure you pass your return to sport testing. And even people who pass their return to sport testing doesn't mean they're not going to re-rupture. It's just you're giving it the best chance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I hope that answers your question, Ryan. Uh, what are the key time-sensitive signs during video consultation? Straight leg raise, extensor mechanism, getting the knee straight. If you've got a straight leg raise and you can wait there and you have full extension, it's probably not so time sensitive. Yeah. When you have a knee full of blood, I'll go back to the, 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 the five things, the fracture, the extensor mechanism, the big ACL, the big meniscus or patellofemoral, normally they all need referral. Okay. But only one or two of them, the locked knee or the, the extensor mechanism, are going to get an urgent operation at the risk of coronavirus. Yeah, I agree. And I think, like you said, that's a good good summary of actually what's urgent at this time period uh, and puts things into context. Okay, anything else you want to ask? Or... No, I think we covered quite a lot of things. Um, I think we're looking really forward to discussing the um, worn knee. Um, we could maybe even cover cartilage uh, defects and problems um, in that topic as well. Uh, could I just think, can I just do a couple more things, with Rishi? Yeah, very sure. quickly. Go ahead. Rehabbing meniscal repairs and micro fracture. 
okay? So the, the most important thing is for the meniscus, if you do a meniscus repair, is to stop squatting. So when you rotate fully, mm -hmm. okay, and do a deep flexion, the meniscus rolls off the back of the knee. So when people say, why do you brace the meniscal repair? That is the reason. You stop okay, it, right? Yeah. If I can... To show you the picture. Yeah. This is the medial meniscus right here. Mm -hmm. Medial side. When you squat, all your body weight is on that posterior hole medial meniscus. On the lateral side, when you squat, the meniscus rolls off the back. So yeah. look what happens to the meniscus. If you put stitches in these meniscus, menisci, they no will come undone. Yeah. Um, That's a good, uh, good demonstration, actually. So it really brings home the patients. Um, that's why. So that, yeah. Often for lateral meniscal repair, it'll be four, six months of uh, rehab and four months in a brace of two. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to talk about, after a micro fracture or a chondral procedure, I know you these, do these as well, and you, are, you and I are both fans of unloader braces. Yes. So if we're doing an operation on the lateral femur, we'd use a lateral unloader, or a lateral meniscus, we use a lateral unloader to offload yeah. that area and medial for the medial, and it allows our patients to weigh bare afterwards. And yeah, particularly with the ligament, bearing load is very important. So use of an unloader brace after micro fracture or after um, a meniscus repair is very useful. The other thing, just while we're talking about braces, is obviously using a, a good ACL brace, CTI or something, uh, for, a, uh, for children. Mm -hmm. okay? So obviously children's ACLs, we're always going to try non-operative treatment where possible and yeah. getting them a good... Um, at a custom or off the shelf ACL brace can allow them stability and buy them time to get strong. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that was the bracing thing. So that's the, yeah, the rehab why. Someone asked me what's good. The Melbourne ACL rehab is good. Yeah. Um, Tim Hewitt, H E W A -T, T from the States, has written um, tons of papers on ACL rehab as well. Fantastic. Okay. All right, Paul. Well, look, thank you very much for your time. No, you're welcome. You. See you on Friday. A uh, nice comprehensive discussion, and I'll see you Friday, mate. Okay. Right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.